Lectures from the Academy. Welcome. My name is Chrissy Dawn, and for the next few minutes, I'm going to share with you a lecture from the Blue Heron Academy entitled Reincarnating the Teachings of Buddha. This podcast is another in a series of podcasts taken from the lectures of Dr. Gregory T. Lawton at the Blue Heron Academy of Healing Arts and Sciences from 1980 to 2022. This lecture has been presented to the students of the Academy's Holistic Health Program as part of their training in mind, body, and spirit medicine, and for the students in the Academy's ongoing training programs in the Asian martial and healing arts. Reincarnating the Teachings of Buddha I began my study of the Buddhist teachings in 1963 while a high school student and when I was 14 years old. I am not certain about the events that led to my investigation into the Buddhist traditions, other than this interest closely followed and coincided with my study of the Asian martial arts. Many martial arts are closely aligned with Buddhist thought and philosophy. The Buddhism I see practiced today, especially in Western cultures and societies, is, in my opinion, strikingly different than my perceptions of Buddhism in 1963. The Buddhism I studied during the 1960s was more closely aligned with Buddhism as a major world religion, represented by millions of followers worldwide, and the Buddhism I see practiced today, again primarily in Western cultures and societies, is branded and followed as more of a philosophical set of practices centered around mindfulness. Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, which means the Awakened One, was born at Kapilavastu in Nepal during India's Iron Age, sometime around 500 BC, give or take a hundred years. When I look at Buddhism from a historical perspective, beginning with the ministry of Buddha, the early establishment of Buddhism as a religion, and its subsequent fragmentation into various sects too numerous to count, I see a religion having reached its zenith once upon a time, and whose apex has progressively declined, its writings and tenets corrupted not only by time and language, but also through its monastic clergy and scholars. We can learn a great deal about the process of birth, maturation, decline, and death from the writings not only of Buddha himself, but by investigating the manifestations of God and divine revelations that came both before the Buddha and after the Buddha. Scientists routinely use this kind of analysis to understand the anthropological evolution of humanity, as well as that of plants, animals, insects, birds, and reptiles. If we know the spiritual teachings of the manifestations and prophets that appeared before Gautama Buddha, and those that came after the Buddha, then we can ascertain and understand more of what Buddha taught, even though successive generations of monks and followers of Buddha have both misunderstood and changed his original teachings. Consider that Buddha taught between 2500 and 2600 years ago, and for between 100 to 300 years, his teachings were passed on by oral tradition and had not been written down. When the writings thought to be attributed to the Buddha were finally written down, they were not written in the language spoken by the Buddha, which was Magadhi, but rather in Pali and the obscure language of Sanskrit. These facts led to uncertainty regarding the authenticity of Buddhist scriptures and the accuracy of stories attributed to his life. During a talk in London, Abdul Baha, the son of the founder of the Baha'i faith, Baha'u'llah, stated the following. The real teaching of Buddha is the same as the teaching of Jesus Christ. The teachings of all the prophets are the same in character. Now men have changed the teaching. If you look at the present practice of the Buddhist religion, you will see that there is little of the reality left. Many worship idols, although their teaching forbids it. Buddha had disciples and he wished to send them out into the world to teach. So he asked them questions to see if they were prepared as he would have them be. When you go to the east and to the west, said the Buddha, and the people shut their doors to you and refuse to speak to you, what will you do? The disciples answered and said, We shall be very thankful that they do us no harm. Then if they do you harm and mock, what will you do? 
the master asked. We shall be very thankful that they do not give us worse treatment, they responded. If they throw you into prison, we shall still be grateful that they do not kill us. What if they were to kill you? the master asked for the last time. Still, answered the disciples, we will be thankful, for they cause us to be martyrs. What more glorious fate is there than this, to die for the glory of God? And the Buddha said, Well done. The teaching of Buddha was like a young and beautiful child, and now it has become as an old and decrepit man. Like the aged man, it cannot see, it cannot hear, it cannot remember anything. Why go so far back? Consider the laws of the Old Testament. The Jews do not follow Moses as their example, nor keep his commands. So it is with many other religions. How can we get the power to follow the right path? By putting the teaching into practice, power will be given. You know which path to follow. You cannot be mistaken, for there is a great distinction between God and evil, between light and darkness, truth and falsehood, love and hatred, generosity and meanness, education and ignorance, faith in God and superstition, good laws and unjust laws. Perhaps to better understand the teachings of Gautama Buddha, we should follow the guidance suggested by Abdul Baha and examine the teachings of Jesus Christ, whose ministry followed that of Buddha by approximately 500 years. When we examine the instructions Buddha gave to his disciples, as quoted above, we can clearly see similarities between Buddhism and Christianity. Christ gave these instructions to his disciples as recorded in the Christian Bible, the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 11 through 15. And whatever city or village you enter, inquire who is worthy in it, and stay at his house until you leave that city. As you enter the house, give it your greeting. If the house is worthy, see that your blessing of peace comes upon it. But if it is not worthy, take back your blessing of peace. And whoever does not receive you nor listen to your words, as you leave that house or city, shake the dust off your feet. Truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that city. Further, Abdu'l-Bahá said Buddha was the cause of the illumination of the world of humanity, and described Buddha as one in a succession of messengers of God. This is a belief that is not well received in today's Western Buddhist communities, and indeed among certain contemporary Buddhist monks. However, for millions of Buddhist adherents in countries such as India, China, Thailand, Myanmar, and Sri Lanka, who accept, follow, and pray to Buddha as a manifestation of God, this statement conforms to their beliefs and actions. Buddhism in the rural areas of most countries with a large Buddhist population continues to be theistic in character. Followers of Buddha throughout South Asia recognize Buddha as a prayer-hearing and prayer-answering manifestation of God in the same manner as do the followers of Christ or Muhammad. Statements made by modern Buddhist scholars and teachers that Buddhism is and always has been non-theistic and does not believe in a human soul nor an eternal life are in opposition to the early historical accounts of the life of Buddha and the current practices of millions of religious adherents. As I previously explained, insights into the teachings of Buddha can be gained by studying the spiritual teachings of the world religions that both preceded and followed the teachings of Gautama Buddha. The spiritual essence of the world's religions does not change. It is only the outer trappings and customs that change from divine manifestation to manifestation. The revelation of religious and spiritual teachings is progressive in nature, as each religion is founded by a divine messenger has a central purpose and objective, renews the human spirit, gives purpose and impetus to society, and elevates humanity to new levels of knowledge and obtainment. Consider, for example, the adoption of Gautama Buddha into Hinduism and its deities, and his position among the Hindu deities as a manifestation of Vishnu, 
or the many Christians and followers of various other religions who incorporate various Buddhist teachings, such as that of reincarnation, into their religious and spiritual beliefs, or the practice of Buddhist methods of meditation along with their daily prayers and supplications for assistance. My own observation as a teacher of the Asian martial and healing arts for thousands of students is that many individuals have combined beliefs and practices from Buddhism and Hinduism with Christianity and do not strictly identify with any organized religion. For many of these individuals, their spirituality is manifested through yoga, tai chi chuan, qi kung, dao yin, meditation, mindfulness, and other esoteric activities. To better understand the teachings of Gautama Buddha, today I would suggest studying the teachings of the world's youngest religion, the Baha'i Faith, and specifically the writings of Baha'u'llah, and comparing these writings to a few remaining scraps of authentic writings attributed to Buddha. For example, the Buddha said, as is recorded in the Diamond Sutta, Thus shall ye think of this fleeting world, a star at dawn, a bubble in a stream, a flash of lightning in a summer cloud, a flickering lamp, a phantom, and a dream. And in the hidden words of Baha'u'llah we find this statement. Live then the days of thy life that are less than a fleeting moment, with thy mind stainless, thy heart unsullied, thy thoughts pure, and thy nature sanctified. For those individuals who are on a quest to understand the true essence of the spiritual teachings of the Buddha, I would suggest two books written by Baha'u'llah. First, The Hidden Words, and second, The Seven Valleys and the Four Valleys. In The Hidden Words, we find a renewal of the essence of the spiritual teachings of all the world's great religions. And in The Seven Valleys and the Four Valleys, we find a description of man's search for spiritual truth and his beloved. Both Gautama Buddha and Baha'u'llah emphasized the need to transcend the material and intransient things of this world. Baha'u'llah stated, He must purge his breast, which is the sanctuary of the abiding love of the beloved, of every defilement, and sanctify his soul from all that pertaineth to water and clay, from all shadowy and ephemeral attachments. He must so cleanse his heart that no remnant of either love or hate may linger therein, lest that love blindly incline him to error, or that hate repel him away from the truth. Even the lives of Gautama Buddha and Baha'u'llah shared similarities. Both Buddha and Baha'u'llah came from families of wealth, power, and nobility, and could have lived comfortable lives free of suffering. But both chose, instead, to sacrifice themselves for the education and benefit of humanity. I hope this talk has helped you in your understanding of the divine nature of Gautama Buddha and his position among the great teachers sent to educate and to elevate humanity. I also hope to follow this talk with a further explanation regarding the positive, periodic, and continuing appearance of the great teachers on earth. This has been your narrator, Chrissy Dawn, and it has been my privilege to share this lecture and podcast with you. I hope you will continue to listen to our lectures from the Academy series. Until next time, stay the path.